How many people here have either been in or are in some form of open relationship? Fair amount, that's great. Um, of the people who have done that, how many people have experienced some form of jealousy or emotional upheaval? Fair amount, pretty normal. Um, I'm going to start with some basic truths about jealousy. And I'll read them and I'm going to elaborate a little bit on each one, but I want to blow through this information pretty quickly. Um, first of all, a lot of people will make the argument that monogamy is a cure for jealousy, and if you're in a monogamous relationship, you're not going to experience these, quote, negative, unquote, emotions. Um, that's not true. We're all socialized the same way, and you can have jealousy and negative emotions in monogamous relationships, just like you can in open relationships. Um, it can be mastered. It, um, it can be mastered, and it should be mastered. If you let jealousy rule you, then, it, you know, if you give it license to rule you, it will control you. That, you know, and it's not about eliminating it, it's about putting it in its place. It's about putting it in perspective, it's about learning from it. Who here believes that jealousy is a teacher? I do. Jealousy is what? A teacher. I'm sorry. It's hard because I'm kind of doing the handout on the thing. Um, okay. You're not trying to suppress jealousy. What you're trying to do is learn from it, and you're trying to stay still long enough that you don't do something stupid. Jo a running joke of my wife and I is, yeah, but they don't stop and think. But he did that, stop and think. But what did it stop and think? The idea being is rather than let the emotions start to agitate you and get you to do something stupid, say something you wish you hadn't said, um, you got more people for handouts over here too. Um, the, the, the thing you really want to do is slow yourself down long enough and sit with the emotion and understand what it is it's really trying to teach you. Because in a nutshell, what jealousy is really doing is it's, it's like a compass that's pointing to some issue that you have, most likely, something that triggers you. And that could be lots of things. That could be an abandonment issue. That could be um, a sense of being excluded. That could be a sense of fear of that you may lose your partner if they're with somebody else. There are all these emotional triggers that we all have as human beings that we walk around with. And when we start feeling these emotions, it usually isn't what he or she or she or he did to you. It's usually how you're processing what happened and what in you, what in your psyche it's hitting, what raw nerve it happens to be striking. So jealousy really, really is a teacher. These negative emotions, and, I, and I'm going to use the word negative, but the truth of the matter is I don't even believe they are. These strong emotions that can lead to potential agitation, um, they're a teacher. Um, pain is just data. You know, when you feel discomfort, when you feel some pain, it's, you know, it's data. It doesn't mean the world's ending. It just you're getting data, you're getting that compass pointing to something that you might want to look at a little more carefully, and in the meantime, stop and think and don't do anything stupid. We all get that one? Um, sometimes it's based on the truth. Maybe your partner really is leaving you. It's not outside the realm of possibility. Um, but more often than not, when you're feeling these emotions, it's you. It may be something they did that triggered it. It may be some miscommunication or lack of boundary setting or um, you know, not having set up your parameters well and then needing to go back and re-communicate about these things. But at the end of the day, the reason you need to do those things is because we all walk around with emotional garbage and that stuff gets triggered. Um, you can't remove it entirely from your life. You can't remove it entirely from open relationships. It's a very rare person in open relationships that doesn't experience some form of jealousy or discomfort along the way. And I've been, I, I will qualify this by saying that I have been a poly activist and I've been running meetup groups and doing workshops for 15 years on this subject. And 
and I will tell you that it is a very, very, very rare person who does not experience some of these strong emotions once they go swimming in these waters. I'm sorry. Better? Yeah. Okay. Oh, it is, isn't it? Um, again, there's usually some psychological root to the emotion that you're feeling. And um, if we're, where are the buttons that set us off? We can, we can really slow it down and, 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 and fix it, with ourselves at least. Um, these are just some basic truths about jealousy. I'm going to get into really specific things that you can do and that your partner can do to help navigate these waters. Um, and I have some definition of jealousy here. It is an expression of insecurities, such as fear of rejection, abandonment, fear of being left out, fear of loss. If they're with them, then I'm losing something. You know, if they go to that show with that person, then I don't get to see that show with them. Um, fear of not being good enough. Oh my God, what if they select them instead of me? What if they leave me over that person? So these are all things that can trigger us and again, more often than not, it's really something in our own psyche that it's stepping on. Okay? Um, types of jealousy. We have possessive jealousy, which is, you know, if I can't have you, nobody will. I mean, God, the culture teaches this stuff. You know, you, you see a movie and the person, you know, has some involvement with another person and you're supposed to throw their stuff out the window. You're supposed to have a big scene. You know, how many of you have ever had a, f a conversation with a friend where you talk about your partner doing something or having an interest in another person or, 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 and that other person in this culture more often than not will tell you, get rid of the, get rid of the son of a bitch. They're not worth it. You don't deserve that. Throw their stuff out. Kick them out. This is what the culture teaches. You don't see a lot of movies and TV shows and books in this culture that show people happily having open relationships. It's starting to happen. It's starting to infiltrate into the culture, but it's a very new thing that it's happening here. You know, the culture teaches, the culture teaches possessiveness, the culture teaches jealousy, the culture does not teach abundance when it comes to relationships. And, um, and this is off the topic, but I will say something about open relationships, because I believe this is really important. There's an expression in the poly community, nobody can be your everything. And what typically happens, and I'm not knocking monogamy because I understand that monogamy is the right choice for a vast amount of our population in this culture. But let's say, for example, I don't know, you are really into the opera. He is really into baseball. You hate baseball and he hates the opera. And you have a closed relationship, a closed marriage, where God forbid you go to a opera with another guy. God forbid he go to a baseball game with some female co-worker or male or whatever, depending on orientations and stuff. Um, you end up not doing these things. You end up, these, these interests end up withering on the vine. We end up letting go of things that interest us because we're really not allowed to, to experience them with other people. And, you know, the nice thing about polyamory, someone said to me recently, she, she and her husband had entered into it, and she says, um, you know, my boyfriend's totally different than my husband. And I'm like, good. <laughs> you know, because you don't want to date someone just like your husband. Why bother? It's just a lot of work for nothing. But, you know, you want to experience different people. You want to experience different things. And, um, you know, that is one of the gifts of open relationships, is we get different things from different people. We grow in different ways from different people. People are mirrors in relationships, and we learn from the mirrors that, are, that we reflect back on us. And if you have one mirror, you're going to get one perspective, and if you have three mirrors, you're going to get three different perspectives, and you're going to do a lot more growth. Um, okay, so we have possessive jealousy, exclusion jealousy, um, frequent polyamory, um, not, from not being shared or included. I will tell you, for me, this is a hot button. Um, my wife has a, we, my biggest waterloo in my marriage, my biggest um, incompatibility in my marriage with my wife, and this is something we've discussed many times, is I practice a style of polyamory I call tribal. And by that I mean, I like the people who are important to me to know the people who are important to me. I like everyone to be able to sit down and have dinner. Um, I like peop I like tribe. My wife practices this type of polyamory which we call compartmentalization. 
And when she's with her person, she doesn't really want to think about me. She doesn't want to text. She doesn't want a phone call. She, you know, her, the guy who she's been dating for five years has made it clear he has no interest in developing any kind of real friendship with me, that he's there to date my wife. They both practice a very different style of polyamory. And, and there are many styles of polyamory. There's many ways of doing this. And I will tell you that this is the biggest incompatibility in my marriage. And this is something she and I have discussed hundreds of hours have gone over this. And then we try to compromise for each other and give each other what we need, but it's really difficult. Um, competition, jealousy. Oh, he's taller than me. You know, he's, you know, she's prettier than me. She's thinner than me. Um, I had some people at a workshop and the, um, the guy was on crutches. He had scoliosis or something, I don't know. But he was on crutches. And one of the things this couple shared was when his wife, they were at some function, and when his wife was dancing with another man, that was the thing that triggered him because this was something he knew he could not give her. You know, and coming back to what I said about Polly before, well, you know, do you not dance with other people? You know, in a lot of traditional marriages, that would be the solution. But here she's able to have this experience, and grant you, it triggered the man, but he also was able to sit in a group and talk about it. And that's the growth. Um, ego jealousy, being concerned what other people think. Oh, if my wife is dating another guy, I must be like a cockle or something. I must be less than if I let my wife do that. You know, that's what, that's what the neighbors are going to think. Um, and just garden variety fear. Because, you know, stepping out of your comfort zone and stepping out of what society tells us to do and what we've been socially conditioned to believe is scary. There are cultures around the world who practice open relationships, open marriages, tribal community, um, and there's a great book called Sex at Dawn. I don't, has anyone here read Sex at Dawn? Yeah, quite a few, that's wonderful. Um, that Chinese, that tribe in China that they talk about in the book, with its matriarchal society, that thing is awesome. Um, great book. Hey, let me tell you something. The men did much better, the men did much better in a matriarchal society than a page than a patriarchal society because once you took men's ability to stop women's behavior out of the equation, there was more to go around for everyone. It, act, it really worked out quite well for the men too. Um, okay, so what are some of the things you want to do when you're feeling jealous? Um, and incidentally, if anyone here came in late and doesn't have the outline, Nick has a pile of them over here. So just raise your hand and he could give them to you. You pass them around. Does anyone? Um, first of all, admit your feelings. Don't deny them. Oh, I'm not jealous. That's just, you know, that's just you being sensitive because you went out with another guy or another girl or whatever and, and you think I should be. You feel bad about what you did. No, I feel like shit. I feel insecure. I feel hurt. I feel whatever. But admit your feelings. If you don't admit it, you can't fix it. If you don't admit it, you can't address it. If you don't admit it, you can't learn from it. Um, if you don't admit it, you're going to do something, something stupid. You're not going to stop and think. You're going to turn around and call your partner some hideous name that you're going to wish you could take back 10 years later that you can't do. So first thing you got to do is admit you got a problem. Not that different than AA. Um, allow yourself to be frightened. There's no disgrace in being scared. There's no disgrace in feeling your emotions. Allow yourself to feel them. Listen to your pain. Listen to what it's trying to teach you. You know, and then we're going to talk about it a little further down. You need to still yourself, and that's a hard thing in American culture. We're always distracted by something. Who's squirrel? Um, you're always distracted by something, whether it's the internet or TV or drinking or the telephone or, or, or. Sit down and feel your feelings. Who here practices doing that? Feel you? It's good. It's a great way to learn. It's a great way to grow. Um, again, don't react. You know, you feel that feeling. It's quite acceptable to say to your partner, listen, I'm feeling a little funky right now. And I'm not quite sure what's going on yet. So I think maybe I want to take a mulligan and step away and, and sit with these feelings. And then I want to talk to you about it. I just had a conversation. I have an um, ex-girlfriend who still lives at my house. 
who I have a wonderful friendship with, and um, something had happened which had triggered me. This was a couple months ago. And I have sat with these feelings for a couple of months. I came to, I realized what it was that triggered me. I waited for the right opportunity to discuss it with her. And then finally, you know, we sat down and talked about it. And, you know, I will tell you that I'm probably closer to this person while we're not dating now than, I were, than we were when we dated. But, you know, it's okay to sit with your feelings, figure out what's going on and coming back to it. Um, give yourself permission to learn new ways of thinking. Hey, guess what? We are all socialized. As much as we um, may want to think that we're all independent thinkers and we're following our own compass, we're all products of this culture to some degree or another, to whatever degree we've been able to shed it off. So give yourself permission to learn new ways of thinking. You know, don't just go with what you've always known. Um, you can't deal with jealousy emotion, uh, constructively by making it someone else's fault. Own your emotions. If you feel something, they're your emotion. If you're feeling jealous or insecure or hurt or resentful, they're your emotions. You didn't make me jealous. You know, you, you, it's how you process what it is. It isn't what happens to you that determines how you feel. It's how you think about what happens to you that determines how you feel. That's cognitive therapy. And I'm not a therapist, you clear on this. But that's like, that's the basic premise of cognitive therapy. It's not the things that happen to us that determine how we feel. It's how we think about it. Hey, you know what? Um, and they used a really good example in the um, poly discussion, um, I think it was yesterday, where she had somebody coming over and they were late for dinner and she had put all this work into dinner. And, you know, then be really hurt. You know, they show up an hour late, the souffle fell. Or they show up an hour late, but she was late getting it together and everything was fine. You know, but even, I, I guess it's not even a good example of what I'm saying, actually. <laughs> I, I am in that. Um, but, if, you know, if, if something happens, if someone shows up late, you can say, oh, they just don't care about me, they're not taking this seriously, they, you know, and, and put it on them and feel like crap. Or you can say, you know what, I am really glad that I'm involved with somebody who works that hard and is that dedicated to what they do, and when something came up, stayed and took care of it before they came home. And it's all how you frame it in your mind is going to determine how you feel. And this goes for all kinds of stuff in life, not just jealousy and open relationships. Um, okay, again, can't make other people wrong. Try to express yourself but not blame others for your feelings. Um, again, a placing blame on other people, I love this, it disempowers you and takes away your control of your feelings. As soon as you start blaming other people for how you feel, you no longer are driving your emotions, someone else is. That's giving someone else way more power in your life than you want to give them. Really important. Um, seek support from friends, people who are um, supportive of open relationships. Don't go to someone who's going to be judgmental. One of the hard issues, even doing couples counseling or triad counseling or quad counseling or whatever, because you know it comes in all shapes and sizes. Um, one of the hardest things is finding a therapist who isn't going to judge you. So. Um, we have an expression in my poly community down in the Philadelphia area, it takes a village to raise a poly. And, um, you know, I like that. It, it, it is, you know, the point being is, I, I, the people I know who try to do this in isolation, they're like, oh, I'm going to open up my marriage and I'm going to start dating somebody and it's okay, my spouse is going to start seeing other people and, and, and. And then it's all well and good until the shit hits the fan. And when it does, if you don't have that support system in place, if you don't have people you can talk to in an honest and open way, you know, where's your support? You know, you're not going to do this alone. I mean, not literally alone, because of course it involves other partners and whatnot. But you need people who are outside of your relationship to talk to. My wife and I, um, you know, we've gone through, I mean, we've been together for 20 years. We've gone through this evolution of all, first, you know, not being open and then being open and, and different permutations and combinations thereof. And we used to date people together as a couple. And again, coming back to my tribal definition, I really love that. I mean, to me, I love dating as a triad. And uh, we dated both genders. 
And um, one of the things we would always say to somebody when we dated them is to say, do you have somebody who you can talk to beside us? Do you have somebody who you can talk to about this stuff who's not going to judge you for it? And we would always make sure that that person who was getting involved with us as a couple had somebody outside of our relationship who they can go to when stuff arose. Because stuff is going to arise. I, I can pretty much guarantee you that part. Um, jealousy teaches you to love yourself, take time to nurture yourself. You know, when you're feeling bad, that's a good time to do the things that maybe you want to do. You know, maybe it's go take a walk in the woods. Maybe it's go spend time with a friend you never get to see. Yes? Uh, some people call that self-care. Self-care, mm-hmm, absolutely. But, um, you know, jealousy gives you a real good excuse for doing that, for, you know, for doing that for yourself. Um, practice sitting with your feelings rather than numbing yourself. And this is, this, this is not as easy as it sounds. You know, the obvious one is, okay, don't get drunk, don't do whatever to numb yourself. But what other ways can we numb ourselves? Does anyone want to throw some out there? Reading a novel to absorb yourself. Another one? Food. Food. Exercise. I didn't hear you. Exercise. Exercise. Um, I'll tell you what some of the real noble ones are. Workaholism. Oh, the isms. Workaholism is, you know, a, oh my God, they're such a great spouse. All they do is work 90 hours a week. They're such a great provider. Guess what? They don't want to come home. <laughs> there's, there's a reason why they're working 90 hours a week because that's preferred to their life with you. Sorry, but um, sometimes, sometimes. It depends on the profession, I get it. But no, there's, the, the point is, it's a noble, noble addiction. It's a nobleism, and people don't usually look at people who exercise a lot and work a lot or volunteer a lot. People don't usually look at them as numbing themselves. It's called process addiction as versus substance addiction. But it all has the same roots. It's all about taking you out of yourself and getting yourself numb. So the opposite of that is sitting still, turning off your phone, turning off the TV, not getting drunk, and sitting with your feelings and experiencing them. You know, and that it sounds easy. It's like, oh yeah, I could do that. Try it. I'd, I'd say to anybody in this room, I'm not, I'm not a big meditator. But I would say to anyone in this room, if you don't meditate, try sitting down with no stimulus whatsoever and sitting with your feelings and see what it's like. Who here, who here practices that on any kind of regular basis? Few. Terrifying thought for the rest of us, isn't it? <laughs> God, what's going to come out? Um, okay. While sitting with your feelings, Focus on your strengths, not your weaknesses. You know, you start saying, oh my God, I'm not good enough, and I'm too fat, and I'm this, and I'm that, and of course they want to be with them because I'm too dumb, and da, 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 da. You're gonna feel like crap. That's not the answer, you know. You want to stop and think about why they fell in love with you in the first place. You want to think about all the good things you bring to the relationship. Again, it's not what happens to us, it's how we frame it. Um, I have a list of things here that you can do to also, um, I, I won't say numb yourself, but maybe distract yourself. You know, draw, sing, exercise, cook, express yourself in some way. Expressing yourself is good because when you're feeling negative emotions, what, however it manifests, meaning the expression, whether it's, you, you know, you draw or whether you write a song or, you know, whatever, you go into your wood shop and you, you turn some wood on your lathe, or whatever, you know, these are all ways to bring out your feelings. And, uh, yes? What's the distinction between something like that and what you were just saying? Of the process addiction? Yeah. It's a matter of degrees. Mm -hmm. I think that, you know, you're not going to sit down for an hour with your feelings in the beginning and go, oh, I'm just going to sit here and, and work on my emotions for the next hour. You're going to sit there for three minutes. And you're going to be, okay, I had enough. I'm going to go turn on the internet now. 
and maybe next time you'll do it for five minutes. And maybe another time you'll be able to, you know, sit down for you'll, you'll surprise yourself and you'll, you'll really sit for 20 minutes. And the time after that, you might be back to three minutes. You know, it's not a linear thing, but it's like a muscle and you start to build it. Um, it's a matter of degrees. When it becomes, the, the definition of addiction, and this is substance or process, the, 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 you know, the definition of addiction is when you start doing it to a point of dysfunction in the rest of your life, you know, and you do, addiction is to do a substance or a behavior to numb yourself. This culture is a culture of numbing itself. You know, American culture is a culture of people who are constantly distracting themselves one way, shape, or form or another. So to sit with your feelings is a very alien thing. And, you know, add to that fuel to the fire, you're opening up your marriage, you're opening up your relationship, you're watching the person you love go off on a date with somebody else or spend a night with someone else or take a vacation with somebody else. And, you know, that's just a recipe for an emotional meltdown. You know, and so, unless you really don't care, unless you're so distracted by your life. So, you know, you're taking a very challenging situation and doing it in a culture that doesn't support that kind of emotional growth. Does that make sense? Okay, do nice things for yourself. Um, don't employ substances. I mean, look, realistically, you're feeling some pain and you drink a couple glasses of wine, God bless you. You know, I mean, what the hell. But if your answer to your partner went out on a date is to get shit-faced drunk and have them come home and find you on the floor, that's a problem. You know, so again, it's a matter of degrees in how, you know, how you do what you do to distract yourself. And this is just my own, I'm going to say it with coffee. These are all my personal beliefs. Um, there is no gold standard of this stuff. This is no, you know, um, you know, there's no underwriter's lab sticker on this lecture. Um, but this comes from a lot of experience and a lot of conversations with a lot of people and a lot of reading. So, you know, take it for what it's worth. Um, ask yourself what images uh, disturb you the most. Is it the thought of your partner, you know, having some crazy monkey sex? Or is it the thought of your partner making dinner for the other person? Is it, you know, is it the thought of them having physicality or is it the thought of them emotionally connecting? What really threatens you? I know people in, a few years ago I had to go, I went to a funeral of someone who I knew through the swingers community and um, I met this couple there who I'd known for years. They were diehard swingers. They were not polys. They had an open marriage that consisted of physicality with other people, but no emotional connections. And I saw the wife at this funeral, and I was talking to her. And I go, how are you guys doing? It's been a while. And she's like, oh my god, we're terrible. Like, what's, what's going on? She goes, my husband's in love with somebody else. She goes, he talks to her on the phone two times a day, three times a day. She goes, we're swingers. I didn't sign up for this. And the truth of the matter is, they were fine going to parties and having sex with other people and going home and, you know, and being with each other and not sharing those other parts of their relationship. And when the husband, and th these people were swingers for years, they were an older couple. And, you know, when, when he crossed that line, that was the thing that the wife couldn't handle. It wasn't the thought of him having sex with someone else, it was the thought of him having a telephone conversation. I know people that have been in triads and had, you know, gotten together, had all kinds of sex, did this, that, whatever, and then when the guy took, the other man took the wife to a movie, that's when it all hit the fan. Hmm. Crazy, but it's reality. Um, Again, so think about what images are disturbing. Think of what images aren't disturbing. You know, visualize your spouse or your partner making dinner for this person. Visualize your, your partner doing different things with this person and see what leaves you with a bad feeling in the pit of your stomach. See what makes you start having a little bit of shortness of breath. And those are the things you want to, that, those are what we call breadcrumbs on the trail to help you figure out, you know, what's really going on. Make a list of all the positive things you share with your lover. Pull it out and read it when necessary. 
We raise children together. We raise animals together. We build a wonderful home. We volunteer together. We've been through each other, with each other through thick and thin, whatever. But make that list. And then, you know, when you start getting these insecurities come popping up, pull that list out and look at it and say, you know what? I'm being silly. Yes? What about when I first read this line, I thought you meant, like, the metamorph. Mm -hmm. Like, a comparative list with the metamorph. So, what do you think about a list of positive characteristics you share with, you know, your, your wife's lover? Your I think that's an awesome idea. If, if you have that relationship, I think that's an awesome idea. I have very, I'll get to you in a second, Nick. I have a very, very, very limited um, relationship with my wife's lover. And I will tell you, my wife and I live two doors apart. We own four houses in a row. We live two doors apart. And her lover lives on our property with her. So this is not an easy situation for me to have to deal with. Yes. Uh, it might be good just to uh, make it explicit what a metamora is. Just for oh, okay. Does so anyone here? Does that, who here does not know what a metamora is? Okay, metamora is your poly in laws. <laughs> <laughs> this is your partner's partner. So they're not directly related to you unless you're dating as a couple. Say again. Could you hand? Yeah, it could be your partner's partner's partner, too. But these are your poly-in-laws. These are the people who you are not directly coupled with, but that who you have a relationship with. And ideally, you want a healthy relationship with your metamors, just like you would with your in-laws. Um, okay. What are some of the things, and go through some of the things I should say, if your partner is jealous, what are some of the things you can do to support them in their jealousy? Support them, I shouldn't say in their jealousy. Support them in getting through their jealousy and going through their emotional growth. Um, let, them, let them know you're there for them. Be available, be generous with your time. Um, don't try to fix the problem though. You know, there's a real fine line. Let me, let me roll it back. I believe that open relationship is a path of emotional growth. I believe that if you challenge, and this is not for everyone, this is not for most people, but I believe for the people who do do it, and who do it well, and who stick with it, and who don't just go, oh, this is a great chance to get laid, but are like, they're really going to do the growth that it takes to practice it, I believe that you can't possibly not grow by doing this. I, I jokingly call it an anvil in which we forge our personalities. And you know, there's a lot of sparks on an anvil when you forge metal. And Polly isn't all that much different. Um, so the fine line is, you want to support your partner in their growth, but you don't want to let their emotional SARS, Yiddish word, um, you, gotta, you don't want their emotional SARS to be manipulating and controlling your behavior. So, you know, it's one thing if you and your partner say, look, well, you know, your partner comes to you and says, look, you know, I, you went out Friday night, and I just came home from work, and I was all by myself, and it just left me feeling like crap. And maybe you'll be like, you know what, I'll tell you what, if Friday's a work day, I agree. Can we maybe do it every second week, or can we maybe do it, okay, I'll be here on Fridays, but, you know, I want two Saturdays a month with my partner, with my other partner, with my lover. And you compromise, and you discuss it, and you do it, and you do it in a way in which, so, it's not triggering this person to say, coming home to an empty house. Great. If it's, you know, every time you go out, I feel like crap. So you've got two choices here. You could either keep going out and your partner feels like crap, or you can acquiesce to your partner's emotional issues and they're taking you an emotional hostage. And so, and there's no right answer to this. There's no just, oh, just go out and ignore it. And there's no just, you should just stay in. But I would say to you that there's a really fine line between being supportive of your partner's emotional growth and becoming codependent and enmeshed with their emotional insecurities. Does anyone here not get that? Say it again. I said there's a very fine line between being supportive of your partner's emotional growth as they go through their own issues of jealousy and insecurities as you practice this and not being taken an emotional hostage by having their their insecurities control your behavior entirely and and, and that that's, that's life in general 
You know, because there are certain people that will totally manipulate you with their emotional moods. They'll keep putting it on you, and a lot of people are very susceptible to this. It's not easy to say no. Um, did I hear someone? Okay. Um, okay. So don't pull away because it's too painful to hear your partner's pain. Oh my God, I just, I, I just can't listen to this. It hurts me too much to hear your pain, so I'm not going to listen anymore. Bad move. You know, you're both going through this growth together, and, and you know, you both got to stick it out. You both got to stay the course. You, you really, to a large degree, need to listen to your partner's pain. Now, if it gets to a point where it's the same thing over and over and over and over, and they're not growing, and they're not moving forward, and they're not communicating other than you're wrong, and I feel like crap, well, you know what? That's something you really need to look at. Um, okay. If they're open to being taught about jealousy, support them. You know, if they want to go to a therapist, if they want to sit down, you know, we have, I have... Um, I've been around this for 15 years. There's a woman who has 10 years on my wife and I who is one of the most successful polys I know. And, um, you know, we jokingly call her our poly guru. You know, there's a lot of people that come to us because of the meetup groups we run and stuff. And, you know, there's a lot of people look at us as the old heads. But the truth of the matter is we then have someone who's older than us. And an older being meaning at this longer has done the emotional growth. And, um, you know, we both commit to putting the time in and having the conversations because, like I said, we've got some real incompatibility going on in how we want to do this. Okay? Um, let your partner know that you will not be manipulated by their jealousy. And this comes back to what I was saying before. You know, it's one thing to listen. It's one thing to be em empathetic. It's another thing to let somebody else's mood swings control your behavior. Can you, you know, think of an abusive marriage. You know, or about a marriage of codependence. Think of it a marriage where one of the spouses has um, an alcohol problem and is abusive. And the other person is making excuses for them not showing up for work and making excuses for all the lousy behavior. Eventually, you've got to reach a point where you say, you know what, you're an alcoholic. You know, and either, there's a point where it's also the person's responsibility. You want to be supportive, but you also have to, you know, the person feeling the, the difficult emotions needs to own them. It's not about what you did to me. It's about how I feel about what you did to me, how I process it, how I frame it in my mind. Um, okay. Some more managing jealousy. Negotiation can make all the difference. Like I said before, okay, I come home from work on Friday night and the house is empty because you're out. What about five minutes? Thank you. Okay. Um, negotiation can make all the difference. Um, be able to identify the hot buttons. You know, find out what it is that's triggering you. Um, the way to unlearn jealousy is to experience it and learn from it. You're not going to avoid it. If you think you're going to do this and not feel the emotion, guess what? You're going to be what we call poly road kill. Have you heard that expression get up here? Yeah, poly road kill. That's all the dead bodies along the side of the road who thought it would be a great idea to open their marriage up and didn't do any of the work. Doesn't work. Um, remember, the real test of your love is when you can be vulnerable and show your weakness to your partner. It isn't about accusing them, and it isn't about, you know, making them wrong. When you can say, hey, you know what, I'm feeling really insecure about this, and you can show that vulnerability to your partner, you know, that's an act of love. Um, uh, sometimes the expectation of how you're going to feel is worse. You know, oh my God, I know that if they go away for a weekend, I'm going to feel awful. And I, I, they're going away this weekend, and I just know I'm going to feel awful. And then the weekend comes and you feel awful because you set yourself up for it. How about, you know what? She's going away this weekend and I get to play. I get to go canoeing. I get to hang out with my friends. I get that guy's night poker night. All the things that I'm going to have my buddies come over. We're going to smoke cigars in the house. <laughs> Whatever. You know, and I'm just making this stuff up as I go. The examples I mean. Um, be able to, again, share your feelings and insecurities. Um, 
Another thing is, as you develop poly tribe and poly family, you're going to find that you get your, your, your affirmations in other ways. You know, it's not all about this one person trying to be your everything, but you realize that you're loved by a lot of people. You know, um, if you're feeling unloved, go, go love something and see how that feels. Volunteer. Okay, now I'm going to really quickly hit envy and compersion. Who can tell me without looking at the sheet the difference between jealousy and envy? Does anyone? Okay. Jealousy, the, the, the emotions feel the same. The difference is, if you can fix it by doing, like, your partner goes out to dinner at a nice restaurant with somebody, and you're feeling these negative emotions. If you go out the next weekend to that restaurant with your partner, and it's all okay after that, that was envy, that wasn't jealousy. If you go out to the restaurant and you're still angry because they went, that's jealousy. And compersion is the gold standard of polyamory, which is actually feeling happy for your partner's partner and, and the contributions they make to their life. You know, I'm really happy that he's dating my wife because she's getting to do all these things that I hate doing. They get to go dancing, they get to whatever. Um, he gives her things that he can listen when I just don't have the capacity anymore. You know, so when, if, you can, if you can develop that kind of positive emotion for your metamor, or for that matter for your partner having these other relationships, you know, compersion is that positive emotion that, that we strive to develop. And I will tell you, when you, know, when you get to a point where your, your partners are all, you know, friends, which truthfully is all I really want from my wife is to be friends with her partner. I mean, it's real simple. Um, but if you get to the point where, you know, your partners are all friends with each other, and you know, you got two partners who are like both sitting there planning your birthday party <laughs> or some other special event, you know, you've arrived. You know, that's, that's, that's the compersion. You know, that's, you, you know, that you are appreciating what they bring into your partner's life you're appreciating them for what they give somebody who you love. Does that make sense? Okay, what do I got? Like one minute left? One or two questions? One or two comments? Yes? How would you deal with something like envy where you're just not people, like you're envious of like the other person? It's like, oh, she's good, she wanted it because it looks better, or you like. Or Focus on your own strengths. Could you repeat you know, the question? Uh, he, oh, sorry. Gentleman said, how do you, if I understand you correctly, how do you deal with envy when it's something that you can't give your partner, and you're not giving your partner? It's like a physical attribute. Okay, a physical attribute. He's taller. He's um, more buff, whatever. Um, focus on the things that you give your partner. Don't worry about what they give you. That's the whole point they're doing polyamory, because nobody can be your everything. So maybe you're not buff, but you're smart or funny. Or emotionally supportive. Yes. So in, in the example you just gave, you said, "Oh well, maybe they're not smart or they're not beautiful." But what do you have in the case where it's the opposite? Where they're everything and all that, and you're and you're feeling totally insecure. No, no, no. Where they're just totally opposite. In everybody. I don't. I'm not understanding the question. Uh, so, for instance, let's say someone's a libertarian, but the other person is a statist. Uh -huh. Or somebody's this way, somebody's a complete opposite. So it's not so much an overlapping that completes a picture, but just completely the opposite, if that makes any sense. Then they're getting something from that person that you can't give them. And if it's, you know, it isn't for you to judge what should be important to your partner.